Nico PolitiFest 2020 Pick Your Future. I am Scott Lewis, the CEO and editor in chief at Voice of San Diego. It's great to be here uh, this evening. In case you're not familiar with Voice of San Diego, just a uh, quick brief. Uh, we are a nonprofit news organization. We are here to uh, both find out what people are saying, make sense of what they're saying, and then find out things that they don't want to say, put simply. Uh, we give you the tools, uh, the public that you may need uh, to be advocates for public good and for, uh, for good governance. As a nonprofit, we depend, of course, on our members to make this all possible. We have about 3,200 members now uh, who uh, pay for this service, and we are very grateful for them. I'd also like to take a minute to recognize our sponsors who help make PolitiFest possible. A special thanks to the Google News Initiative for supporting uh, the creation of this event. They gave us, uh, uh, endorsed our plan to try to create a whole new system of events that we've been practicing the whole year. Events were a big deal to Voice San Diego, and uh, I was worried about them uh, being lost. And I um, also just wanted to give a shout out to uh, the College of Arts and Sciences at USD for underwriting all the student tickets to the San Diego, uh, to the San Diego uh, Foundation as well for supporting our community conversations. And thank you to the Cox Communications, sdg &E, the Atlantis Group, the City of San Diego Retired Employees Association, uh, the City Heights Community Development Corporation, and the San Diego uh, County Democratic Party for supporting their uh, panel about the future of the county. Uh, so we have a lot uh, to discuss, and I'm very excited to bring on a couple of people to do that. Uh, first off, uh, Joe Liebenthal uh, is um, uh, is here. He's a uh, uh, a lawyer and a small business owner, and Marnie Von, Wil Von Wilpert is here. She's a, a, a deputy city attorney. Welcome to you both. Let's have a good conversation. Eh? Thank you. Thanks, Hi. All right. Well, so uh, we've got a lot to go over, but first, I I've been kind of shocked myself about how little discussion in some of these races. Some of the biggest things about our lives right now aren't being discussed. Uh, and, and in particular, about the pandemic and about the city and the county's responses to that. So I want to start with you, Joe, and just ask, do you think, you know, early in the pandemic, the, the mayor shut down, uh, uh, you know, uh, city beaches, he moved people into the convention center, the city had a major role, maybe not in charge of public health response, but the city's response to this whole thing was a big deal. It, it affected all of our lives. Uh, what do you think about this region's response to the pandemic? Do you think it's gone well? Do you think uh, the efforts to reopen, some of which didn't go so well, uh, have been right on? Do you think we need to be going more urgently? Where do you th where do you see us right now, and 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 how do you feel about our response to this virus? Sure. Well, I, I appreciate the question, Scott. I also appreciate Voice of San Diego doing this. I appreciate your sponsors. I've been uh, a member myself of Voice of San Diego for a few years now. I miss the events as well, uh, great events that you put on member coffees and things. So uh, appreciate everything that you do. And it's a really good question. Uh, you know, I actually did a podcast pretty early in this pandemic. And, you know, one of my messages in that podcast was it's really easy to criticize our leaders right now, but we probably shouldn't. We should uh, give them some benefit of the doubt. And people are making mistakes at all levels, but, but people are really trying hard and making some really good decisions at all levels as well. And we're in, in an unprecedented time. Obviously, we've had pandemics in this country historically, but not in this generation. And so I do think when we have the benefit of time with this pandemic, we can adjust some of our decisions. Uh, there are things that I think we closed down that we probably didn't need to close down quite as uh, aggressively as we did. Uh, there are probably things that we maybe didn't close down uh, as quickly as we should have, and maybe should have given some additional consideration to additional measures. Um, I think masks is a great example. Uh, we, uh, and this wasn't just a local issue, but I think we were slow to say to everyone, wear a mask. I remember looking at the CDC guidance myself uh, on masks and it was really opaque. It was hard to make heads or tails as to what they really thought about masks early in this pandemic. But I think now it's common knowledge and common wisdom that we should be wearing masks when we're close to folks. Um, so, you know, again, I think that, uh, you know, my opponent likes to kind of criticize me for some of my views on uh, providing funding for our schools uh, so that when it is safe to open, they have the resources to do it. But as I've said over and over and over, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a health expert. Uh, I would have to rely on those that are to tell us what is safe and when it's safe. 
Well, Marnie, uh, he mentioned you a little bit. What what do you feel uh, has been, what, what's your impression of how the county and the city have operated, have opened things, not opened things? Should it be going more urgently? Do you think the response and the leadership so far has been adequate? And yeah, you should probably address the point he just made. Have you criticized him for trying to get money to school? Hey everyone, uh, well thanks again for having us and I've been a member of Voice of San Diego as well. I read your morning report every morning and, and the political report, so thanks for all that you've done. Um, I, For those of who don't, don't know me, my name is Marnie, I'm from Scripps Ranch, I actually grew up here in San Diego and I'm a deputy city attorney. And uh, one of the issues I work on as I'm prosecuting a lot of price gougers and COVID scammers right now. I. Um, I have a lot of views on our public health crisis. So I actually served in the Peace Corps in Botswana in the height of the AIDS epidemic in Sub-Saharan Africa in the early 2000s. So I have done contact tracing and testing. I have deployed local government public health programs and I know why it's important. I think the biggest failure that we've seen in our country has been the failure of a consistent, steady public health message. Our national government has admitted, the White House and Trump admitted that he thought this was going to be much worse for America than he disclosed to us. And because of that, we weren't ready. It should not be a political discussion whether or not to wear a face covering and make sure you are safe and your neighbors and your family members are safe. You know, it's the key to opening our economy and our schools and keeping them open will be to get our public health crisis under control. And part of what I get to do as a city attorney is help work on this from the inside. You know, I've done enforcement letters to grocery stores where we didn't see enough enforcement of wearing face coverings so that our grocery workers who are just trying to do their jobs and get our families fed every night are protected and making sure that customers interact with them safely. I also got to help work on the ordinance that allows businesses to open up onto sidewalks now that we know that being outdoors is safer for the spread of the virus and indoors and move into parking lots and sidewalks and things like that. So the city overall needs to be much more nimble. You know, we should not we should be able to always react this way. When a business has a new idea or a community group or a nonprofit has a new idea, we should be more nimble in helping them adapt. You know, the failure of a national strategy has been one of the biggest reasons that the United States is at the top of the charts for all of the deaths and the, uh, the cases in the world, and, and we shouldn't be. In terms of closing, one of our things that we can refine is not having to close down necessarily an entire county at this point if we have certain tests and hot spots in certain areas. You know, we should deploy our public health resources very wisely. And if we see a certain area of town, such as sadly, we had a big outbreak with SDSU, doesn't mean we need to have increased testing all over and close the businesses in Rancho Bernardo or Scripps Ranch, it means we need to focus it and make sure we get increased testing, education to the hotspots. And so I know we use a county level because that's how our county governments are structured to deploy our health and human services systems from the state. But I think we can actually start refining and using our contact tracing and testing better to only target hotspots as much. And the dispute that Joe and I were referring to is we both agreed that schools need funding, certainly, especially in the pandemic, but uh, he had proposed to use the city's CARES Act funding to do that. And I disagree. You know, the city is facing a $350 million budget deficit. Our CARES Act money was around $249 million, and we're using it on public safety and making sure that we can respond and keep our city services open. And the city government, the state is actually funding schools. And so is the federal government getting their own CARES Act. If we ever get the HEROES Act or something else passed in Congress, hopefully the schools will get more funding. But I ran his proposal by the mayor's office and they said we'd have to have fewer city services if we started giving our money to schools, which we have no jurisdiction over as a city anyway. So that's our disagreement. Uh, let's see. I was trying to... Joe, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, do you want to respond to that point? Uh, I, I would imagine you have a little bit different perspective. No, I mean, I think, well, I don't think she's characterizing her, her, her attack on me that I'm reading. I mean, her attack is that I was recklessly calling to open the schools. And I, again, I'm not a health expert. I'm not saying when we should open the schools, but I am concerned about schools that don't have sufficient funding for adequate protection. And just because our schools are getting some additional funding from the state or federal government for uh, coronavirus precautions doesn't mean they're getting enough. And there is a divide in our school system in this county, in this region. And you know, my, my fear is frankly, schools where my kids go are not gonna have a problem because we have so much uh, additional financial support from parents, but there are a lot of schools in this county that don't have that type of financial support. Now, you know, I, I don't know who she ran my proposal by the mayor's office, but I don't necessarily 
disagree. Obviously, if you spend some of, and I wasn't saying all $248 million, but some of the federal CARES Act dollars on our schools, then it's going to take away from other priorities that the city has, obviously. And, and frankly, I don't know that this current city council, which has three individuals who are running for higher office right now, this city council was willing to make some of those hard decisions and start making some of those challenging cost cutting measures and frankly kicking the can down the road to either Marnie or me and the rest of our council colleagues next year to make even more challenging decisions. I don't think that was responsible. I think that was political. And this council frankly should have started to say, where do we start making these adjustments so that city departments could actually uh, adapt to those adjustments in, in a stepped process, not all, uh, all at once next year. Well, um, I wanted to encourage anybody who's out there to uh, put in your quote and questions. Uh, I see it, it must be somebody related to you, Marnie, that is having trouble getting in there. We'll make sure to hook her up uh, and, and get her connected. Uh, Claudia, if you can't hear us yet, we'll get you set up. Um, uh, I will uh, look into that as well. Right here. But I wanted to follow up with you, Marnie. You said something about you're looking into COVID scammers right now. You said you even said prosecuting. What exactly are you doing? with COVID scammers right now. Can you highlight some that you've pulled out or, 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 or uh, you know, made scurry away? Uh, yes, yeah, so a lot of them are still um, not public. They're still in work with the city attorney's office and not just us, it's the district attorney of San Diego. And um, I've even gotten in one case involved with the Orange County district attorney. Um, and a lot of it has to do with selling products to people that say they can diagnose immunity from COVID or selling fake tests or things like that. And so once those wrap up um, and become public, we can disclose them. A lot of businesses have also been caught price gouging. We've gotten tons of complaints from the community about price gouging on essential goods, such as everything from water bottles to milk to toilet paper to M95 masks. And we've sent out hundreds of investigators to make sure that we find out what's actually going on. You know, everyone we assume is innocent first and have found that a lot of places are price gouging. And so we're able to resolve those complaints as well. I'm also working on the um, eviction moratorium with the city and making sure that landlords understand what the law is and tenants. You know, this is not rent forgiveness, but it is making sure that if you can prove you can't pay your rent due to a economic loss for COVID, that you're not being evicted right now. And I've actually gotten quite a few more calls from small businesses than I have from tenants because small businesses are also protected by the eviction moratorium right now. And a lot of them are struggling because they were forced to close and they did for all of our public health. And so we need to make sure we find sustainable solutions for them at the end of this too. What, um, that issue, that word uh, a prosecutor became an issue between you two um, uh, about when uh, his campaign, Joe Leventhal's campaign, uh, said you you shouldn't be allowed to use that uh, on your ballot description. Uh, you do participate in civil uh, actions that the city attorney takes on behalf of the city of San Diego, um, and uh, but not necessarily criminal. The judge said well, most people understand prosecutor as as a criminal term, uh, even though you do prosecutorial things. What does the word prosecutor mean uh, to you when you say you are prosecuting those kinds of things? Yep. So uh, there was a ballot challenge. I'm a civil prosecutor for the city of San Diego. I represent the people of the state of California when I go to court, just like uh, the district attorneys do. And um, the judge thought that most people wouldn't know the difference between a civil prosecutor and a criminal one. And so he said that I shouldn't use it. I have more faith in the voters and the judge does to know the difference. Um, you know, white collar crime is, is also a crime. And I go after major corporations who break the law. But I'm, I'm fine running on my ballot title of deputy city attorney, and I'm very proud of my prosecutorial record. And we'll just continue and see how it goes. Joe, did, is that a satisfactory answer, adequate for you? I don't know what you mean by satisfactory and adequate. I mean, I, when we challenge the ballot title, it's because three dictionary sources define a prosecutor as someone that has criminal law experience. And I understand Marnie's position, uh, but the judge, I think, got it absolutely right, saying that it was a false and misleading use of the word prosecutor because voters would mean it, would understand it to mean that she does criminal work, you know, pulling bad guys off the streets. And uh, she is continuing to use prosecutor. Her ad that just came out calls her a prosecutor, doesn't qualify it as a civil prosecutor. And, uh, and, and again, I think I, I understand why she's doing it. I think there's political gain 
in, in doing it. Uh, it's not a term that she ever called herself before the general election. She didn't call her that, call herself a prosecutor in the primary election on her LinkedIn, any other source that I could find. Uh, so we challenged it and the, the judge made his ruling. Uh, it only affects, the, the ruling only affects her ballot title, but I do think that it continues to be misleading to voters. Well, uh, let's move on. We broke a story today about um, uh, a particular thing we've been following for some time, and that is uh, the question of a uh, transitional or a, a, a navigation center in East County, or sorry, East Village, <laughs> where uh, homeless folks could go uh, find services that they may need, be redirected to housing opportunities, but there would not actually be any shelter there. Uh, the city rushed to buy a building, a, a former skydiving facility, uh, they they jumped over a, a lot of normal obstacles to pulling something like that off. Uh, just today, we learned that Family Health Center, Centers, who was operating that facility, uh, was terminating its lease and had some really, uh, uh, the leader of that, uh, who we've had on our shows before, had some really harsh things uh, to say about that. And I want to read um, what she said. This contract uh, she didn't say it to us. This was um, uh, an email she sent to the mayor. Uh, this is Fran Butler Cohen from the Family Health Center. She said the contract has been a disappointing experience uh, and one that required much effort without the expected quality support or commitment from funders. And then she said this during the last year, we have come to understand from reliable sources that the Navigation Center project was an orchestrated more as a public relations undertaking than a needed and important component of the homeless con continuum. This is something the city spent a lot of energy on, a lot of money on. Uh, did you support that, that effort? And, and what do you think went wrong? What would be different if you were part of the oversight of that effort? Uh, Marnie Von Wilper? Sure. Um, and I, I want to just address one thing Joe said as well. Um, you know, I appreciate your view on prosecutor and the American Bar Association defines prosecutor as a civil prosecutor as well. Um, you know, and your firm defends white collar criminals. So I thought you would know this. Uh, but also, Joe also had a ballot title challenge and he's not a small business owner. He's a regular business owner, which is great, too. Business owners are I support them. But um, we both had ballot titles that we both lost. In terms of the navigation center, I was never in favor of purchasing it. I actually work on homelessness issues with the city and with our police department on a regular basis. You know, I work in law enforcement with our police every day. And uh, I thought that we need a lot more work on getting addiction care and actual mental health treatment that is not a jail cell or an emergency room. And we have a lot of navigation opportunities going on just up the street. You know, the PATH Center, for example, already has a lot of different social security, driver's license, other offices that folks can go to. We could have better utilized existing structures for navigation than buying an indoor skydiving center for this purpose. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll get to transition a lot of it into um, permanent supportive housing. I've heard that's a possibility for the indoor skydiving center. One of the things I'm very proud to see the city doing is doing a lot more coordination with homelessness in the convention center project that has been going on. So obviously since all the conventions had to be canceled, we've sheltered up to 3000 homeless people in our convention center. And one of the reasons we know that public health works measures like masks and temperature checks and screenings work is because the convention center staff started doing them with homeless individuals before the governor even made it a mandate. And that's why they performed almost 7,000 COVID tests and only 21 positive cases. Um, that's not the case up in Los Angeles or San Francisco. So I'm very proud of San Diego. I've seen every day at the convention center, individuals and advocates come together and work in a holistic manner. And we need to see that continued after the pandemic as well. Scott, I think you're muted. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> uh, Joe, your take on the Navigation Center and, and um, what might be different if you were part of the oversight uh, of that sort of effort? Sure, just to take a step back as well. Uh, I, I am a small business owner. Uh, in addition to being an owner of uh, one of the owners of my law firm, I, I'm the owner of another small business, which actually lost its last customers uh, when COVID hit. So if I, I didn't have a judge rule against me. I, I simply said, it's not important enough to me to say small business owner versus business owner. That's why my ballot title has changed. Um, but in terms, of the, in terms of the indoor skydiving center, I think I agree with Marnie. I was never a, a fan of that proposal. Uh, in talking to homeless service providers like Father Joe's Villages, Alpha Project, uh, so many places actually offer 
uh, essentially mo you know, most of the services that homeless individuals need. And so the idea of, of trying to invest, frankly, a lot of money in one center where with the expectation that's where all the homeless individuals are going to go and get those services, I think was somewhat duplicative and overly costly. Um, it is a project that was done while uh, Marnie was in the city attorney's office, uh, but I understand that I don't know if it's something that she worked on or not. Uh, but again, it's something I think we agree on. It probably was not the right approach. And uh, and frankly, homelessness is a huge reason why I decided to run for city council after the hepatitis crisis in the city. So I think a lot of what we've done historically in the region uh, has not worked. And I think we need to change our approach. Do you want to respond to that, Marnie? Respond just... Uh, do, did you have any uh, involvement in that or uh, did you, I think he was implying that you were um, somehow maybe partly to blame for it or something like that? Oh, oh no, I didn't understand. I didn't think Joe was saying that at all. Um, but uh, no, I didn't work on it. In fact, you know, I, I do get to work with the mayor. I brought the mayor to court with me a couple of times on some of the major class actions against the city. And I remember mentioning that I didn't think it was a great idea, but I'm just a lowly deputy city attorney at this point. So uh, I don't have <laughs> that kind of influence yet. But that's one of the reasons I'm running for city council is because I can help make a big impact on the cases that come to my desk. But I don't want to wait for cases to come to me. I want to be out in the community listening to voters, finding out what they need, and then using the law proactively to make lives better for all San Diegans. Well, uh, speaking of homelessness, uh, one of the things on the ballot this time is uh, the, uh, uh, the Measure A, and that's the measure that would increase property taxes and allow the city to borrow a significant amount of money and, um, and invest that in affordable housing construction. They'd have to get money from other uh, sources, from the federal government, from the state government, maybe from private sources and, and donations to cobble together to fund what can be rather expensive housing units, but for permanent housing opportunities for some of these folks. That is known again as Measure A. It is a property tax increase. Uh, it would start out uh, at one level, probably go up over time up to, I think, uh, what is it, $22 per $100,000 of property that you own uh, or that somebody owns. Uh, so, you know, do the math. If you have a $500,000 home, be about a hundred bucks or whatever. So, uh, Marnie, uh, am I right that you are for Measure A? Is that correct? I am in favor of Measure A, and I looked at it very carefully because we have to look at everything carefully. And we're talking about taxpayer money, especially now with so many people feeling the crunch of the econ economic contraction because of COVID. But I was really happy to see the San Diego Taxpayer Association is in favor of this measure. And they said it's actually more fiscally responsible to alleviate some of our homelessness problems rather than continuing to dump money into systems that don't provide permanent supportive housing. And like you said, it will be about $115 of, of tax a year for a property owner who owns a $600,000 home. So um, the other issue is we have to actually have more housing that's affordable for homeless individuals to get off the street. You know, we see great success so far in keeping people safe during COVID with the convention center, but where are people going to go afterwards? And we've been able to place quite a few people into permanent housing from the convention center. But if this is a fiscally responsible way to uh, build the housing we know we need to solve part of this problem, then I am in favor of it. Joe, uh, what's your take on Measure A? I, it's not a fan, right? I oppose it. Uh, correct. I I generally oppose any increases on property taxes, uh, and I I think this is the wrong time to be increasing property taxes when when so many people are struggling. More and more people are out of work because of COVID. Uh, but I also think it's not the um, the explanation for why we have homeless people on the street. Uh, you know, the Los Angeles Times study said the average price of an affordable housing uh, unit now is five hundred thousand dollars. Nobody's going to be coming off the streets and, and purchasing their first home or their next home at $500,000. I think the Point Loma study is much more relevant, which talks about the fact that 40% of all of the cost of housing is based on government uh, bureaucracy and fees and delay. And so I think really that's where we should be trying to focus when we talk about increasing housing supply in the state and certainly in this region and in the city is what is the city doing? And I think people, the county should be saying, what's the county doing? And people in Sacramento should say, what is Sacramento doing? That's increasing the cost of housing for the consumer. The new in lieu fee, for example, is, is a great, a great example. I think, uh, you know, when that, when that in lieu fee in 2024 goes up to its, its uh, proposed amount, uh, 
for a 1200 square foot unit, that's an extra $30,000 on the price of that home. So, you know, we wonder why housing is so expensive when government is is forcing the cost of housing to be so much so much more expensive than it really needs to be. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, let me pull something up. This is a map of the district um, from uh, the District 5 uh, Council site. Uh, it's the ranchos, lots of ranchos. Uh, you've got the Scripps Ranch, you've got Rancho Bernardo, you've got San Pasqual. Um, a lot of what might be considered suburban areas, obviously it's part of the city of San Diego, uh, long history behind that, but it's a it's a very suburban area. And, and I've been kind of surprised to see the president of the United States, Trump, um, um, Donald Trump, make a point pretty regularly about sub suburbs and did so again last night, suburbs being under attack, that if uh, if Joe Biden wins, that suburbs would be over, I think was his word, or, or um, be under threat. Uh, and behind that is is uh, a concern that uh, single family housing uh, and sort of uh, what might be the biggest restriction by the government, as you just mentioned, on the creation of housing, which is the single family home zoning laws, which literally prohibits, in many cases, more housing, more homes being built in an area. Uh, and in, in a large part, in, in a lot of these areas, it's hard to picture uh, you know, multifamily homes being allowed. Uh, there was a question that came in from uh, Lisk, uh, who has been the leader of that. Uh, Ricardo Flores has been making a point throughout the community that uh, probably the kind of thing that tr that Trump is referring to, an effort to maybe change single family zoning. He said a question uh, to, con uh, to consider for the two candidates. Um, do they believe that the history of single family zoning like that uh, was used to segregate black and brown families from these richer areas? And uh, do you support, um, you know, lifting those kinds of bans? That that really is uh, the harshest, I think, government regulation on building housing is that you literally can't build it in some of these areas. Joe, is that uh, something uh, that uh, your neighborhoods, if you represent, uh, should reconsider when they think about uh, accepting housing or, or developments in the area? Well, I, one of the things I've said early on is I support uh, I support re-examining our uh, community plans uh, on a regular basis so that we, we look at zoning and we look at zone changes. And I think the community planning groups need to be heavily involved in that. Um, you know, I, I believe that there is a history of, um, of uh, redlining in this country and, and other things. I, I don't know, to be frank, enough of the history of the city of San Diego. Uh, what I do know is I, I go right, at, right outside my neighborhood, uh, not even outside my neighborhood, and I see um, non-single family homes. There are a lot of non-single family homes in District 5. Uh, and I think District 5 often gets a bad rap as somehow being uh, just a NIMBY community when you look at how many uh, homes and uh, multifamily homes have actually been built over the last 15 years or so. Uh, you look at all of the Stonebridge, Stonebridge area, you look at the entire Del Sur area, uh, you look at Pacific Village that's going in right now. It is, it is true. We're very much uh, in the suburbs. And, and, and some of that is the community you know, the community of San Diego. We have different neighborhoods that have different character and different feel. And when you know, Rancho Bernardo was growing up, uh, people weren't looking for multifamily homes like they were single family homes. The market was driving builders to build single family homes. And, and back then there was plenty of land. It wasn't, it wasn't a lack of, uh, of land. So uh, certainly we need to make sure people of all backgrounds have access to housing. Uh, in in city of San Diego, and to be frank, it's one of the top issues that I hear from business owners. They talk about how they can't keep workers because they're commuting from Temecula, Murrieta, and as soon as they find a comparable job up there, they don't want to make that commute down here. So, you know, I've talked to my constituents and said, "Hey, we do need more housing, not only for our nurses, our teachers, our firefighters, our police, but also for people that support these small businesses in our community." Do you agree with Trump that the suburbs are in danger right now uh, and, and would be in, in worse danger uh, were his opponent to win? I don't, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on at the national level right now, Scott, because we're, we're focused on a campaign here in the city of San Diego. So I, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with anything that, uh, that the president has to say because I'm not listening to it right now. Do you consider yourself a supporter of him? I'm not talking about national politics. And here's why, Scott. I know my opponent would like to bring national politics into this race. That's what her campaign mail has been all about. It's been all about uh, the president. 
presidents are polarizing figures. This president is, the past president was, I want to focus on the city of San Diego. I have three kids, I've got a great career, and I'm willing to sacrifice those things to focus on service for our community. And I'm somebody who wants to unite the community. I don't wanna be divisive. And so we all know national politics is divisive. If anybody tuned in to any of the debate last night, which I caught just a glimpse because I was spending a little bit of time with my kids, uh, nobody wants that here in San Diego. And that's not gonna be the type of leader I am. Marnie, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of things for you to consider addressing there. But first to the question that came in, um, you know, do you believe that the neighborhoods that you want to represent um, were part of a result of, of this sort of historical redlining, keeping people of color out uh, and protecting uh, single family homes and in particular white residents from them? And should that be um, reformed in any way? Uh, is there more room for multifamily uh, housing in your area? And should that uh, single family zoning at all be, be reconsidered? So I think it's a great question and I appreciate LISC asking it. Um, the presence of redlining in our country is just about straight up racism. Said that people of color cannot get mortgages. They cannot get homeowners insurance in certain parts of town to deliberately keep people out of certain neighborhoods. And it was direct racism that made that happen. Um, I actually live in a, an apartment, a wonderful apartment here in Scripps Ranch. So there is with a lot of different families, of a lot of different backgrounds and jobs and ethnicities live in my apartment building. And it's actually wonderful. Um, like Joe said, there are quite a few multifamily homes around all throughout our district. And I think it's an important part of the community. It's also something that senior citizens who may want to retire and settle in the neighborhoods they live in, such as Rancho Bernardo, Scripps Ranch, all the ranchos, um, they need an, a, a nice place that they can downsize to in our communities as well. And that will then open up more inventory for young families to move into the bigger homes, which, which would be lovely. So I think that, you know, addressing racism is something that our our country is is confronting right now on a nationwide basis. And I'm glad we're having these discussions. I'm happy to see that the city of San Diego has opened uh, the rate, the Office of Race and Equity. And that's going to be something that the next council will really get to implement, make sure that we don't keep race and equity in our is a passing moment this summer, but it's actual part of our conversations going forward from here on out. Um, in terms of uh, Trump saying he's coming for our neighborhoods, I am definitely voting for Joe Biden. Uh, I, I think that what Trump is doing is dividing our nation much more than it needs to, to be at all. And the suburbs are unsafe because especially here in San Diego, we face huge wildfires. You know, climate change is one of the biggest threats to our suburbs here. And both Joe and I remember the evacuations. And my family almost lost their home in the Cedar Fire. We are on fire in California. We have 16,000 firefighters across the state. And President Trump comes here and says, I don't believe the science. I don't think there's climate change. That is the threat to our neighborhoods. And of course, we have to pay attention to national politics because they affect us every day. If Trump says we're not going to get FEMA funding or he's not going to implement a national climate change policy, that will affect us here in San Diego, whether it's sea level rise, whether it is weather, drought, whether it is climate change. Same thing about what's going on, the economic recovery. You know, you, there's. Been, you, oh, I'm just so I I think that it's really unfortunate that any candidate or any person isn't paying attention to national politics, that's gonna be deciding our fate for the next four years. And I've been campaigning against bringing Trump into San Diego. My party is not the party that supports President Trump, the local GAP is. And so that's why I'm saying let's stand up to him, not bring that here. And I agree with Joe that we need to get anger and division out of politics. And that's why I've been talking to everyone and my slogan has actually been people over politics since this campaign started. I, I do want you to address that point. Does single family home zoning need to be addressed and reformed or does it have a place in a community plan? I think we can have an option of housing. I think sometimes we can have single family homes and sometimes we can have multifamily homes. I don't think it has to be one way or the other for for the rest of time. You know, I think we definitely need to think about better housing and transportation all throughout the city. And, you know, the idea to convert some places into duplexes could be a really great way to solve problems. The ADUs that we're starting to build could be a great way to solve problems. But I don't think an extreme answer of, we have to ban all housing or ban all of this type, I don't think that's that's gonna be our answer. 
I mean, one of the reasons, and this is something you guys would have to deal with at the city council, uh, the, the mayor has a plan called Complete Communities that's going forward. And it, it basically says that within certain areas around transit and other infrastructure, uh, that uh, a builder should be allowed to build a, a lot more, frankly. And in exchange for uh, that right, which provides a lot of value to that builder, they should do things for the community, more investment in infrastructure, parks, or something like that. But that uh, while it's going forward, it does stop with single family zoning, which affects about 50% of the land that would be available to do this kind of thing on. And so I think, you know, it sounds like an abstract thing, but we are literally having a discussion right at this moment at City Hall about whether that, you know, can be addressed. And he has excluded for various reasons, legal and otherwise, the single family home zoning. And so I guess I'm just trying to really push, is that something you would respect or consider making tweaks to? And I, I guess I'll go back to you, Marty. Um, yeah, I don't think we have to abolish single family home zoning all throughout the city of San Diego to solve our housing crisis. I think that it makes sense to think about building multiple units near transit centers and near business centers because we want to make sure we build our additional build out in a way that doesn't increase the burden on our infrastructure and our traffic. And, and I tell a lot of folks, even if we don't build another house, we still have traffic problems here in San Diego. We still have a transit issue we have to fix. You know, the the American Lung Association noted that San Diego has the sixth worst air quality in the, in the country now, today. That's why I've been such a big pusher of making sure that we actually give people options, even in District 5, of using commuter buses for young professionals to get to work and back, of making sure that seniors who can't drive actually have a transit option and that get cars off the road and get, you know, um, get emissions out of our air. But those are the holistic conversations we have to have regardless of, of how we're going to go forward. I, apparently there was just an earthquake. I didn't feel it. Did you guys feel it? I did. My computer shook, but really, yeah, I've been, I, I grew up here. I've been through so many that I, just I always miss them. Yeah, no, that's too bad. Well, uh, Joe, this question it, wasn't the problem, it, wasn't. Yeah, it looks like 5.0 in Westmoreland, uh, 5 point. Uh, Joe, uh, the question to you though, too, the mayor has been pushing the mayor said, Hey, I can't do anything about these single family home areas around these areas where I want to see this complete communities plan, uh, be introduced. Uh, do you agree that uh, single family homes are just kind of untouched uh, zones are kind of untouchable with that? Well, look, I, I have concerns about the complete communities plan for a number oh, of other reasons, like actually. Okay. I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it, uh, it, it lessens the influence of community planning groups, which I think are critically important. In, in planning and in zoning decisions. Uh, I also think for our district, District 5, it actually shifts a lot of the money that we're spending as homeowners to other parts of the city in a, in a disproportionate way. So, um, you know, again, I, I agree with Marnie. I don't think it's a, it's a all or nothing. Uh, I wouldn't want to see single family zoning abolished in, in the region. Um, but again, I have some real concerns about the com complete communities plan as it currently exists. Got it. Um, I, I want to make sure to invite people who are watching this. I want to hear your questions. What do you want the can candidates to deal with? What kinds of uh, uh, questions or dilemmas uh, do you think aren't being mentioned that we should get after? Um, and of course, this will uh, both be made available in the recording tomorrow so you can watch again or, or for the first time. And then it'll be available to the public after that. Um, so I wanted to ask before I left housing completely and homelessness completely, Joe, uh, do you, there seems to be a kind of a, uh, a uh, concern from the right of center perspective that we've gone too soft, frankly, on, on small crimes, on, um, on uh, crimes associated with homelessness. Uh, the mayor made a pledge, for instance, that he was going to try to do a statewide uh, initiative that might um, make some of these penalties harsher, provide a stick and for the stick and carrot approach of, of, of getting people uh, off the street. Do you believe that the laws are too lenient in respect to the kinds of uh, uh, minor crimes around homelessness, or uh, is, 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 is that concern off base? So when we talk about homelessness, I think we need to talk about a more holistic approach. I think we really do need to focus on and acknowledge that addiction issues and mental health issues are really the fundamental reason why so many and my proposal actually would not have a one size fits all. It would have multiple tracks that we put people on depending on what that underlying reason is. And it would include a separate track for our veteran homeless population, which is about 15% of the homeless population. Uh, but I talk a lot about the fact that we, we can't only have the carrots, we also need the sticks. And it's not because 
we should spend our tax dollars incarcerating or putting in jails our homeless population. I don't want to see that. But historically, one of the things we were able to do was to encourage some of our, our homeless neighbors to make the right choice and go into addiction treatment or mental health treatment. And, and they were encouraged to make that choice because they were engaged in certain crimes that at this point, uh, our, our prosecutors are not able to uh, pursue with a lot of our homeless individuals. And so what we do see, unfortunately, in certain parts of the city more than others, we see a, a degradation of property rights and, and we see frankly, people moving out of certain areas of the city, businesses moving out of certain areas of the city, because the homeless population is, frankly, encroaching on a lot of those uh, private property rights. And I think, um, again, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not at all the first approach, but it is part of the overall plan that we need to make sure we have to encourage people to go into mental health and addiction treatment programs. Marnie, uh, what's your take on that? Uh, first, um, I don't believe that all you know, homeless people are criminals, and I know that wasn't the premise of the question, but I think that honestly, we need to provide a lot better options for folks to actually make the right choice in, in different ways. And one of the ways we did that was the SMART program here in San Diego. The city received a federal grant to purchase a hotel down on Palm Avenue that was already you know, dilapidated and wasn't being used and converted it into 80 beds for um, what's called return misdemeanors who are often committing crimes of addiction and they go to jail for three days or, you know, put in a 5150 hold and then they're released back out into the street and have nowhere to go and nowhere to actually be clean. So I, I do believe that we should have a housing first approach, but not a housing only. Um, so the, the SMART program, the idea was you would have a place to sleep for up to six months, up to two years and actually required to participate like in, like Joe said, in actual addiction rehabilitation treatment, in you know mental health counseling programs, and make sure people have a choice to make, but also a place to go to make it. Now, of course, we couldn't utilize the SMART program right away because of the pandemic hit, and now we have families who are experiencing homelessness in in the hotel, which is you know good that they're off the streets right now. But one of the bigger issues I see with the city is its lack of coordination with homeless services completely. So I do the um, annual point in time count to talk to homeless individuals downtown and see what they need and see why they aren't engaging in city services. And one young man I found sleeping on the street down around Imperial Avenue told me he was trying to get clean. He had been addicted to opioids and that's one of the reasons I'm suing the opioid industry on behalf of the city of San Diego is to get money back for our city services. But he was on Suboxone and was turned away at one of our rich shelters because Suboxone is a schedule one drug and it's used to cut cravings for opioids to help people who want to get off drugs. And he said, instead of losing my Suboxone and going into the bridge shelter, I chose to sleep on the street so that I could continue my rehab program. And why don't we have drug addiction counselors inside every homeless center? And they can take the drug from him and give it to him when it's needed so it's not you know, abused or lost or things like that. But that's the lack of coordination I see that makes it so hard for homeless individuals who do wanna do the right thing and try and get on their feet to navigate all of these services. So I'm, I'm definitely down I'm in favor of making sure that we have programs that are available and you know, um, slight consequences if folks aren't utilizing them. But I already have been working on this from the city's perspective. So I work with the police officers in dealing a lot about our encroachment ordinance. I know there's so many crimes that really aren't crimes in terms of harming other people or, or property rights or individuals, but homeless people don't have a lot of place to go or put their belongings. And I understand the street is not a place to sleep. We cannot have things encroaching on the public right away. People need to be able to get by, especially people with disabilities. But arresting people every time they have tents and lawn chairs and things on the street isn't going to solve our problem and it's going to cost the taxpayers money. So when I got this case, I made sure the federal judge came outside the courtroom with me. I said, sir, we're not going to solve this in court. And I met him downtown five in the morning with the mayor's staff and the police and the homeless individuals and their attorneys. And we walked around and we came up with a solution together. And it was a warning system to make sure homeless individuals are first warned and educated, not just arrested and cited right away. And they wanted a place to put their belongings. So I got the city to open up a third transitional storage facility and it's run by mental health services. So every time somebody goes to have their, put their belongings in a locker, if they wanna study, go to night school or have a job interview, need a place to put their belongings, they're interacting with a mental health counselor. And those are the kind of collaborative solutions I wanna see us do. And I can continue to work on as a city council member. Do you, we have like, uh, I don't know how many right now in the convention center, several hundred people uh, continuing to shelter there. Do you believe it is the city's job to make sure 
each and every one of them, as something of a city charge, have homes to move into after this experience. Marnie, sorry. Okay, sorry. Yes, we're always asking who goes first. Uh, I was looking at you, but you obviously couldn't tell. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I believe the city has a responsibility to try and make an effort. You know, it's not, the city doesn't have responsibility to actually house every person who comes to San Diego. No, but we can do a lot better job coordinating services to try. You know, we are a city that wants to make sure that people are safe and getting off the streets. And so if we have programs such as the landlord engagement program, which actually matches folks who have housing uh, vouchers or section eight vouchers and finds landlords and says, hey, we have an eligible person. Can we match them with you and get them in the house? That's a great idea. I also am very supportive of our flexible housing pool, which allows folks to apply. So if you have a medical emergency or an unexpected bill, instead of not being able to pay your rent and being evicted and then becoming homeless, which will cost us much more money, we allow people to apply for a short-term grant or loan just to pay that extra medical bill and stay in their house. So there's lots of things that the city can do, and I want to continue working on it. Uh, Joe, same question to you. Uh, I, I feel like we, we are actually heading down the path when we did say, come to the convention center, be safe from the pandemic. Uh, it, it does imply we've got you from now on, we'll take care of you, but it doesn't actually have that contract. Do you believe we've, we've maybe headed too far in that direction in guaranteeing them shelter or, or is that a, a, a promise that the city should follow through on? Well, I mean, fundamentally, you know, in my view, local government is health, safety and welfare. And so I think in a lot of ways, this falls under health, safety and welfare. And we saw that with the hepatitis crisis and what happens when as a region, we aren't uh, vigilant in, in protecting health, safety and welfare. Um, and so it's not that we have an obligation to make sure everyone in the convention center has a home. I often talk about this from the approach from, from frankly, two sides of the same coin, which is uh, a taxpayer side. People are shocked when they hear the city spends over hundred million dollars a year on homeless individuals, uh, I'm sorry, on homeless efforts for the number of individuals we've counted. That's over $22,000 per homeless individual. The city council's new plan that they passed nine zero calls to triple that over $300 million a year or over $65,000 per homeless individual. But I'm also a compassionate person and I want to see us if we're going to put all of that effort into trying to address homelessness to do it in a way that actually helps these people. So I think we should be we should be expecting better results for far less tax dollars. Um, and again, I think it's it's easy to make the argument that this does fall under health, safety and welfare, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to make sure everybody has a roof over their head. <clears throat> Excuse me. We've been very clear as a city most recently that we want to make sure we have a bed for everyone who needs one. That certainly legally is something as a city that we need to make sure we do for some of our other homelessness efforts. All right, let me uh, pull some of these questions and, and, and see what your thoughts are. So we have Danny Jackson who's asked, I don't, I'm not familiar with this development, but uh, I'm sure you guys are as plugged in as you are. This is Stara Development off of 56. What are your thoughts on development at the expense of our reserve areas? Uh, and so, uh, uh, Joe, can you take that first? Sure. I'll, I'll be honest. I have heard a, a lot about that, but it's been a while uh, since I've heard much about it. I'm not sure what the current status is of that proposal. Um, and unfortunately, if we get on the city council, we may have to make a vote on these issues. And so we can't take a public position. Uh, but I will say that, uh, you know, with any uh, new development, I'm always concerned about impacts on our environment and concerned about impacts on our traffic schools and other issues. And so I know that is one in particular that the community is very concerned about. Um, and, and I think it had a clever name that uh, included preserve in it. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I would be keeping a close eye on it and what the final proposal would be before it obviously came to me at the city council. Yeah, what you're referring to though is that quasi judicial responsibility that city council members have not to weigh in on these things before they interpret the law about whether they should be approved or not. Um, Marnie, uh, do you have uh, any context for the discussion on that? Yes, yep. And Scott, you're right. You know, um, both uh, Joe and I are attorneys, and so we take the law very seriously. Uh, but um, no, I know the Sistera proposal, and there is a preserve that we have to be very concerned about. Right. It borders our districts in District 1. It's actually right over the border in District 1, but I'm very aware of it and making sure that we do um, make keep our environment clean and healthy and safe and, and make sure that we have nature preserves that the community uses. 
you know, there's a lot of wonderful outdoor hiking going on and learning for kids that can go on outdoors. And we have to make sure we preserve these habitats going forward. And, you know, one of the things I want to see the city do in terms of the economic recovery from COVID is in start investing in green infrastructure. You know, right now we uh, view our water runoff in the city as a liability because it just runs through our storm drains and our streets into our ocean and doesn't collect. You know, we go through droughts every few years. Why are we collecting our rainwater and turning it into an asset? Aren't we actually building green infrastructure to naturally filter the water as opposed to you know, the cement blocks we put in at Toya's Creek? And that will also be able to create jobs to make sure that you know, we make our city more green place that actually is doing a better job with things like stormwater and transportation and uh, creates jobs. So it's a great question. I want to ask you about a couple of things before we run out of time. Thank you, first of all, for spending this time with me. It's uh, valuable to get on the record. It's valuable for a lot of people uh, to watch over the next few days as they make their decisions. Uh, but I think it's, this one might help people understand uh, your perspective, too, on, on broader issues. Uh, one of the issues that voters will be deciding is Proposition 15. Uh, this is the effort to split the roles of the property tax uh, system in California. Right now, obviously, for the last 40 plus years, uh, homeowners and others who own property have not seen vast increases in their property taxes based on their value of their properties going up because of uh, a cap put on by the notorious or famous uh, Prop 13. Uh, that would change with this law. The new fi Proposition 15 would say that commercial properties, not residential properties, but uh, commercial properties, shopping centers, uh, office parks, those kinds of places uh, could begin to be reassessed and uh, at much higher market values. And then property taxes assessed on those values uh, beginning in 2023 and phased in. Uh, Proposition 15 is very popular among uh, teachers unions and, um, um, you know, like SEIU, uh, and it's, be, it's generated a lot of, uh, of opposition from chambers of commerce, those sorts of places. Uh, Marnie, uh, what's your take on Proposition 15, uh, uh, and, and uh, what, what will you be doing on it? So, great question. Um, you know, I was actually talking to um, one of my mentors about this who's endorsed me. I'm our state controller, Betty Yee. Um, she's fantastic and has been a real aid on the on the campaign trail. And it's a very serious question. Um, you know, Prop 15 was drafted before we knew a worldwide pandemic and an economic recession was coming. And like you said, Scott, it doesn't touch residential homes and that's all going to stay the same. And it's um, I'm still looking at the fine print to see exactly how it's going to work. And as an attorney, I need to do that. But my, my thoughts so far are we need funding for our schools and that's where the funding is going to go, uh, especially with the pandemic. We need to keep our kids and our teachers safe. They have to buy plexiglass. They have to buy PPE, you know, Internet. Not every kid has access to Internet right now. And it looks like the federal government isn't going to pass the HEROES Act, which would have funded our schools and our city government. So we don't have the federal government coming to our aid. But then we have small businesses who are now been shuttered for three up to six months because we asked them to to keep us safe. And that's not something any of us expected. And so we have to make sure that they don't, they can actually meet an increased tax, you know, and that's something I'm, I'm looking at as well. Um, it's also gonna be a, an interesting jobs program. So the county assessor would be required to assess commercial properties every few years to have this happen. And they're gonna have to hire and train quite a few people. So I've been looking at it as a very interesting workforce development issue because it'd be training people in commercial finance and real estate, which are very good careers. So there's a lot of different things to look at at Prop 15, and I want to make sure I really do a deep dive before I decide. So, Okay, so it sounded like you're supportive, but you're not on board fully yet. I'm still looking into it and talking to all, all sorts of folks about the economic impacts of COVID on this. But, you know, from, from what I hear, we definitely need to make sure we fund our schools and get that going. And I do support teachers, and they've actually endorsed me for this race, which is great. So it's a, it's a very important conversation we have to have. Okay. Uh, Joe? Well, you know, I think in San Diego, 98% 98 of our businesses are small businesses. And the problem with Prop 15 is for so many small businesses, those leases that they're in are called triple net leases, which means increases in property taxes go right to the tenant that's paying uh, paying that rent and paying that lease. And it's already, it's not, it's not something that gets renegotiated. It's already in their leases. And so I certainly oppose, I strongly oppose Prop 15. I also think it's a first step. 
Uh, it's, I post Prop 15, I think it's the first step in repealing Prop 13 for residential homes as well. And I think, Scott, your, your premise is a good one in terms of, you know, this question kind of helps uh, folks think about how we approach, um, how Marty and I approach things differently. Uh, you know, I, I propose using some of our federal CARES Act dollars that went to the city and, you know, tightening the belt of the bureaucracy in City Hall to help fund things at our schools. And Marnie thinks that we should consider Prop 15, and I understand she hasn't come out supporting it, but consider Prop 15 increasing the cost for small businesses to fund those things. So again, I would rather see us tighten the belt of the bureaucracy at City Hall to fund the things that our schools need. And uh, I think we have a difference of opinion on that. All right, uh, I'm sorry, I've got to cut this, but can you just take 30 seconds each? And um, I'll start with you, uh, Marnie. Just uh, wrap up any thoughts you have uh, quickly. Thank you. I can't, but I want to respond to, to what Joe said. I think Joe's noting his proposal to cut uh, each city council member to cut their own budget um, as a way to save money for the city. And uh, the city actually did that. Each cut up 4% already from their budget for the latest process. But con cutting constituent services at a time when constituents need more services than ever, I don't think is a good idea. Um, but thank you for having me today. I really appreciate this debate and I appreciate journalism more than ever. You know, we have a president who calls the media the enemy of the state, which could not be farther from the truth. So I'm glad to see that you are doing this and educating constituents. I've been really enjoying this race. And honestly, Joe, it's been really great to run with you. I think we have done a much better job than what we saw on stage last night, um, having a really civil open debate. And um, I'm really looking forward to serving the people of my hometown. And I hope to earn your vote in November. All right, thank you. Um, Joe, quickly wrap it up, thank you. I know you're running out of time. Marty, appreciate you as well and, and uh, appreciate running running with you. Scott, Voice of San Diego and all your sponsors, thank you for making this happen. Uh, and, you know, there's just so much more that I could say. There's a great question, Mr. Roy, on uh, transitional age youth, which I think is a critical issue, one of my most important issues. Uh, reach out to me, joeforsandiego.com, and uh, I would love to answer any questions that you didn't get answered tonight. Uh, but again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with all of you and hope that I've had a chance to earn your vote. Thank you all, and thank you again for running. Um, I know what it takes. Well, I, I, I've seen a lot of people go through what you're going through, and I appreciate uh, you guys both willing to do that for our community at a time like this. Uh, good luck to both, and uh, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.